we're going to look at the FRQs from my AP. So uh, in question one, uh, we're looking at a scatter plot, or well, we're looking at bivariate data. We have income and vacation. So the amount of income that you make determines the amount of money that you would spend on a particular vacation. The first question says to create a scatter plot of the data in the table. And the biggest question I got about this one uh, during the day was, can I just bring in a picture of my calculator? Do you guys like the, uh, the pollen all over my calculator? I was doing this outside. Uh, the answer is, if you were to type this in, you would probably not get any credit at all. Uh, I went over here and I showed you, uh, I used L1 income and L2 is vacation. I thought that income was the explanatory variable and vacation was the response variable. Uh, that makes a lot of sense in this question. In order to get full credit for this one, there were a few things that you had to do. And in fact, there were five components that you needed to do. And I did this without looking at the key. And so let's see how, if I did all of them or not. Um, okay, so the first thing they're looking for, it's essentially correct if your calculator or if your graph has eight, has the, uh, contains eight points and their locations are reasonably accurate. And, uh, and so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have all eight points. Uh, this is a reasonable accuracy. I went up by 10,000 on the x-axis and I went up by 500 on the y-axis. Uh, I did that by looking at the minimum x value and the minimum y value and their maximums accordingly. And so I just kind of made sure to decide on what would make sense and I can estimate the values in between, right? So this one, I believe, was around 27,000. And so it's halfway between uh, 25 and 35, right? Just a little bit closer to 25. Here again, uh, reasonably estimate. I think this is probably fine. You can see the actual scatter plot on my calculator here, which is pretty close. Uh, the second thing they're looking for is a label on the horizontal axis, right? So income or annual income or something of that nature. The third thing they're looking for is a correct vertical axis label, right? I'm actually I don't know if they'll give me this. I didn't put vacation, but that's a possible. I don't know if they'll give that to me or not. This is the vacation time. Uh, the fourth thing they wanted was the response axis had to have a minimum of three numbers. I definitely got that, and a minimum of three numbers on the vertical axis. Um, I guess when they say a reasonable estimate, it can be pretty far off. So I think if you had all five of those, right? So I'll repeat that. It's eight points and reasonably accurate uh, location of your points. Two, you had to have a horizontal axis label, a vertical axis label, and it had to have three numbers on the horizontal axis and a three numbers on the vertical axis. Okay, so the only thing here is the vacation may not have gotten credit because I went L1 and L2 here. That's not technically on this axis. I actually meant to put that and just forgot to do it. Okay, so that's how you get full credit for doing question number one. The reason I can't get credit for my calculator is because all of these axes are simply not there. The numbers are not there. The labels are not there. You may have gotten credit for the points, but that would just be one of the four. And you had to have at least three uh, out of the five to get partial credit. Three or four of the five gets partial, and then five out of five gets an E. Anything less than that would only give you an I. Okay. If we uh, go on and look at number two, or B, it says describe an association shown in the scatter plot created in part A. We can still see the graph there. Uh, I'm looking for four things here. I wanted to talk about it has a, uh, a strong relationship. It needs to have, and you can see that I, I kind of listed it all at the same time, strong, it needs to be linear, it needs to be positive, and I need to comment on the fact that no outliers are present. I listed R here because this gives me a really good, uh, I guess it's my evidence for saying strong and our value here was very high. So we have a strong relationship here. So I needed all four of those things. It needed to be strong. It needed to be positive. It needed to say it was linear and you needed to tell me that there were no outliers included. Okay. And the next question or part, it says calculate the coefficient of determination for the data and interpret the value in context. And we've done this quite a bit. We didn't call it this all the time, uh, but that's R squared. So get used to that n name. I did mention this when we learned it the first time. R squared, 
is 0.849 or rounds that to about 85%. And this is the script we memorized when we learned this back in chapter eight, I believe. 85% of the variation in how much families uh, vacation, or how much families spend on vacation can be explained by their income. In order to get credit for this, I had to do a few things. Like before, I think there were three things you needed to say. Number one, you had to give the correct value for R squared, so 85%. Two, you had to give a correct interpretation of what R squared is. Uh, that could be generic or it could be in context. But if you want full credit, you need to definitely put it in context. That's where I put in this extra bit here about income and family spending on vacation. If you did all of these things, uh, the three of those, then you get a full mark for this uh, for this part of the question. And uh, obviously with three parts, you're looking at getting an E, a P, or an I for each correct or partial credit or incorrect statement. Uh, three E's, of course, would get you a four. Two E's and a P would get you a three and, and so forth. So what I really wanted to do in these in this kind of these setup, these questions is really to figure out the details that what I needed to do in order to get all of the possible points and not get docked for little bitty things uh, like just leaving out context or not talking about outliers. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, in this one, we are looking at a scatter plot with uh, residuals and lines of best fits and regression models. So let's look in, let's zoom in and look at number, or part A. In part A, and we're looking over here on the right side of the screen, it says calculate and interpret the residual of the high school senior with a foot length of 20 centimeters and a height of 60, 160 centimeters. And they give you this regression output here. And the ones we focus on for this kind of model is just these two. Remember, the constant and coefficient, this is gonna be my y-intercept. And then foot length, the coefficient of x, which is foot length, right? That's what x variable is. This is my slope. So in order for me to correctly estimate a residual, I need to do a, a residual is always equal to the observed value minus the predicted. Well, they gave us the observed. Like we know exactly how tall this person is, right? They have a foot length of 100 of 20 centimeters and they have an actual height of 160. So what I don't have is I don't have the predicted. Well, the good thing is I can find the predicted value by writing out the equation. So I said height hat, meaning estimate, equals 105.08 plus 2.599 times foot length. I chose to put the variable names in place uh, of X and Y because one of the things that you have to do in this question is you have to define what X is and what Y is. And if I don't do it this way, off to the side somewhere, I've got to have to put X equals this and Y equals that. So this is a way of kind of giving myself a little bit of a shortcut to get to the uh, equation quick quickly. So the observed value they gave us is 120 comma 160, X and the Y. If I want to know the predicted value, I'm going to take 20 and I'm going to plug in for the X. And so we work this out. It turns out that for a person of, that has a 20 centimeter foot, we would expect them to be about 157.06 centimeters tall. Now, if I wanted to find the residual value, we're gonna come down here. We're gonna take our observed value of 160, plug it in. We're gonna take our actual, uh, our predicted height and plug it in here. The residual is the difference in the observed and predicted value. So I'm subtracting those. And these are all Y values, by the way. Residuals are always looking at the differences in your Y values. And that gives me a 2.94 centimeter difference. To put this into context, it says when we estimate the height based on foot length, we will underestimate the height by about 2.94 centimeters or on average, right? In order to get full credit for part A, uh, what we had to do is we had to do, let's see, in order to get credit for part A, we had to say a few things. Uh, number one, we had to correctly identify the predicted value of 157.06 centimeters. And we had to, to, uh, we had to comment on the fact that a residual is the difference in observed and predicted values. We had to talk about this in context of, of the problem. So I couldn't just say the residual is this number. I had to make sure that it was an actual uh, 
predicted height. And the last thing they wanted us to do, so I guess there's four things. The last thing, they wanted to talk about whether we underestimated or overestimated or if that person was gonna be taller or shorter than what I thought they were gonna be. So we will underestimate the height. So this person was actually taller than I thought they were gonna be. Um, you could have said it plain, just that they're gonna be 2.94 centimeters taller than I thought, than I predicted, or that I could, I've could i underestimated their height. But I needed to do all of those things. So let me go back over that. There were four things. Number one, I had to correctly identify the residual, the predicted value. Okay, number one. Okay. Number two, that I had to give evidence of subtracting the observed minus the predicted. Okay, that was the second thing. And I had to put it in context of the problem. Okay, I needed to talk about being uh, talking about height and third, or I don't think fourth, I needed to make sure that I needed to give them that I underestimated, I overestimated that the person was going to be taller or shorter, depending on however you decided to describe it. Okay, those are the different parts. Uh, obviously, you had to get all four parts correct to get a to get an E. If you only got two or three of the parts, then that's a P. Part B. Now, this one was a little bit, I think that was the most involved. Part B, uh, where's part B? I totally skipped part B. Oh, this is part B. No, that's part C. Well, apparently I totally forgot to do part B. So let's, I would just quickly did that. Let's go down and look at it. For part B, um, all right. It wants us to define what the standard deviation is and interpret the value in context. Standard deviation, and this is going all the way back to kind of how we define standard deviation just in general. It's the average distance away from the expected value, I guess is the best way of putting it. We expect things to land on our line, that's our prediction. And when they don't, then it's gonna be off by about this much, right? So for observed heights for seniors, they're gonna vary about 5.9 centimeters from the predicted Y value using my line of best fit, where X is gonna be the foot length. And, and that's really what I wanted to kind of define there. To get full credit, they were looking for three things. Number one, you wanted to contrast the actual Ys with predicted Ys, right? And that's kind of what I talk about, the predicted values versus their uh, actual height values. The second thing, they wanted to talk about it's a typical different distance or a predicted or an average distance uh, from, f from the line of best fit. So if you said it's exactly 5.9, then you would have gotten, you've gotten them marked off. But if you said it's approximately, it's about, it's on average, these are the kind of things that, that you wanted to do. Okay, three, or f yeah, three, we wanted to talk about, it. you had to use the variable name, the height, uh, to get full credit for this. You couldn't say, in, you, you had to put it in context, basically. All three of those things would have given you an E. If you did two of them, you'd get in a P, or if you did one, then you got no credit at all, just an I. Okay, back to part C. Here we go. Part C uh, gives us this residual value, and, or this residual graph. It's giving the histogram of the residuals. And they say that they are normally distributed, approximately, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 5.9. So what are the residuals? Or what's the percent of residuals greater than eight? Well, we know that it's normally distributed. So one of the best things I can do when I have that kind of situation is draw this picture. My center, I'm showing you here, one, two, three, and so many standard deviations. So I'm indicating that these are the values. This is the value at eight that I wanted to find. You can see that kind of... Uh, emphasized over here. I used normal CF to find this area. Eight to positive infinity. That's indicated by the shaded region there. I used a mean of zero and a 5.9 as my standard deviation. And it turns out to be 0 0.08756 so forth. So about 8.8% would, would have been there. Um, let's see what you needed to get credit for that. So number one, for part C, In order for me to get full credit for this one, sometimes this is, uh, you never know how they're gonna go around this one. Uh, it says the response indicates the use of a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 5.9. So there's a number of ways I can do that. I did it in two ways. 
I drew the normal curve here. I indicated my mean and the difference between these values would be my standard deviation. I also indicated those values over here by defining their, just defining them as their names. Okay, that was the first thing you had to do. The second thing, you had to indicate that you were going greater than eight, right? So you can see that here, eight to positive infinity, my lower and upper values. Uh, I probably should have written eight down right there. I didn't do that, but I have it over here, so it's not a big deal. But I can show that here, it's above. Okay, third thing they wanted to know. Okay, uh, your answer needs to be consistent with what you said in parts, uh, in components one and two. So the first two parts that we've already been talking about, they need to be consistent with what you said. So if you made a mistake prior to this, and that mistake kind of carries through, you just need to be consistent about it. If you got all three of these components, no, what am I talking about? To get full credit for part C, I needed to do those things about the curves. I also needed to talk about using uh, the area under the curve. If I use normal CDF, I got the probability here. I needed to make sure I defined what these numbers were by writing out down here or drawing the picture to go along with it. If you did those things, uh, that gives you pretty much essentially correct. On to part D. Now, for me, I uh, I didn't want to, to trust my previous answer of 8.8%, which is essentially 9%, but um, because they changed it from 8 to, to 7.94. So I just went ahead and did it. Um, I said, no, this is not unexpected. We would see this occur in almost one out of every 10 people. I showed you here that uh, I did the same thing like last time I indicated my mean, my center here, my standard deviation, of course I also did it here. Uh, I did not redefine these values because I've already done that in the previous problem, but I also added this curve to it. Uh, in order to get full credit for part D, there were a few things I needed to do. I needed to recognize that a height of 165 is about eight centimeters greater than the predicted height, uh, right? And I showed you, I showed that here is 7.94. That's the, the difference here that I found. You could have used approximately eight which is kind of what we did in part C. The second thing I had to do was uh, I had to determine the percent of people that had a foot longer than 65%. And that's what I did up here at 9%. And it was right at 9%. The third thing um, is to state that this was not surprising or not unexpected because this is really, we're looking at, is it less than 5% or not? In this case, it definitely was not less than 5%. Anyway. If you've gotten all of that correct, you needed three things there just to, you had to recognize that it was eight centimeters, approximately eight centimeters taller. Two, you had to um, find the actual percentage and you had to comment that it was not surprising. You didn't really need to justify that in any way, but you needed to say that it wasn't unexpected. If you got all three of those parts, that would have been an E. If you missed one of those parts, that would have been uh, a Wait, one, two, if, yes, yes. If you got one part, that would have been I, two parts would have been a P, and all three parts is an E. And that concludes this progress check. Hopefully this wasn't too painful for you, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll be doing some review tomorrow, kind of just basic linear regression. I'm going to put some multiple choice questions up. We're just kind of let you walk through that and you can ask me questions. I'll be online.